So, okay, when I first started to research into dementia, I read an article which said what most people fear about growing older is losing their mental sharpness and their memory. And that's really important for fatty acids, because fatty acids are really important in the brain, because the brain is 60% fat. So what you need to keep your memory into going on into old age is a good supply of high-quality oils and fats. And then your body needs to convert those oils and fats into the fatty acid derivatives that your brain uses. So here's a diagram of what essential fatty acids do for the body. We all know they're fantastic for overall health. But today we're going to be focusing on, on the brain health. So essential fatty acids for your memory and brain give you better clarity, better focus. They improve memory and improve learning. So Chris has been talking a lot about the cell membrane, and this is really important for memory. You have to have a very fluid and permeable cell membrane. And fatty acids are a major component of that cell membrane. Chris has been talking about the transport of substances in, through the cell membrane. He's talked about the neurotransmitters, the glutamate, dopamine, and acetylcholine. And also the fact that sodium and calcium have to be pumped out of the cell, into, in and out of the cell. And the vital important nutrient, oxygen, has to be diffused through the cell membrane. And it does this purely by simple diffusion. So you need your cell membranes in really tip-top condition to allow all the oxygen that Chris was saying your brain needs to function. So here's a diagram of the cell membrane. And you can see the, the phosphates, the phospholipids here in the cell membrane. And the little tails there, they're the fatty acids. So there's two, two layers in the cell membrane and all the tails are fatty acids that you need. So here's a diagram showing you the lipid bilayer. And molecules have to be transported through this cell membrane and you do this by either passive transport or active transport. So the first way is by simple diffusion, which as I said is what oxygen does. So simple diffusion is where the molecules pass through the cell membrane from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration. So that's when you need a very good cell membrane. And there's facilitative diffusion, which is where there's uh, a channel in the cell membrane and the molecule goes through the channel with the help of a carrier protein. And then we've got active transport, which is um, with the use of ATP. So it's an ATP pump mechanism, and that carries the molecules through the, through the channel uh, via the carrier protein and with the use of ATP. So here's the diagram of a phospholipid. You've got the phosphate group at the top and you've got the two, the two tails coming off here. The straight tail is a saturated fat and the tail with a kink in it is an unsaturated fat. And the vital thing to remember about the brain is that both of the tails in the brain are unsaturated fats. So you need a big a good supply of unsaturated fats in the diet to give you the two unsaturated tails in the brain. Here's another diagram showing the, the phospholipid. We've got the group at the top. Uh, that can be choline, inositol, <coughs> ethanolamine, serine, or sphingomyelin. And then we have the two tails coming off, uh, and that's the unsaturated one. So just to illustrate the difference between the saturated and unsaturated fat, saturated fats have no double bonds, and the unsaturated fat has, has double bonds, as an example there. So here's an unsaturated fatty acid, an omega-3. You can see the double bond after the third carbon there. So the double bond starts after the third carbon from the methyl end. And it's the carbon which gives it, the double carbon which gives the shape, the kink to the unsaturated fatty acid. So just to illustrate the point again, here's the cis form of the unsaturated fatty acid, which is what we want in the body, in the brain. And you can see the double bond there, and you can see the two hydrogens on the one side, and that gives you the kink in the, in the molecule. And then this one is the trans fat, which we don't want in the body or the brain. And you can see it's been damaged here. The hydrogen is flipped to the other side. And what that does is it straightens out the, the fatty acid, and that makes it act more like a saturated fat. So if you had lots of trans fats in the body and brain, you'd have 
fats that were acting like saturates, not unsaturates. This illustrates the point again, really, that's the trans fat there, which is straight, a very similar structure to the saturated fat. And that's the shape that we want, the unsaturated. So rancidity is, is a big issue, really, with um, brain function. It's been found that people with dementia have high levels of lipid peroxidation, so high levels of rancidity. And rancidity primarily occurs with these unsaturated fats. And that's why it's such an issue for the brain, because we have so many unsaturated fats in the brain, and they are so susceptible to uh, going rancid. This is because of their structure with the, the many double bonds. So fats turn rancid in the presence of free radicals. So here's a diagram showing how a fat becomes rancid. We've got the, um, the unsaturated fat here with the double bond there and the hydrogen. And then along comes the hydroxyl radical, the free radical, and initiates um, a change to a lipid radical. You can see the, the free radical attaching there where the hydrogen was. We've got H2, the two H's have combined together to form H2 and the O, so you've got water and you've got the free radical attaching here. And then in the presence of more oxygen, this, this radical turns into a lipid peroxyl radical. And then you get like chain reaction going on. You get more unsaturated fats here, and you've got the hydrogen there combining with the oxygens there to form the lipid peroxide. So that's the OOH, lipid peroxide. So this is your rancid fat here. And what ran rancid fats do, they give off a substance called malondialdehyde, and we can use that um, as a test. I will explain that a bit later. So this explains what I've just said, really, that uh, reactive oxygen species degrade the unsaturated fats, giving off malondialdehyde. And this leads to a loss of the very important cell membrane. So we use this malondialdehyde as a biomarker to assess um, if a person has high lipid peroxidation, if they're going rancid, if they've got lots of oxidative stress. So we use the malondialdehyde to test if a person has oxidative stress, but we also want to test if substances that we're taking into the body, like fats and oils, are rancid, because we don't want to take on board fats that are rancid. So there was a method put together, a scientific method called the Rancimat method. Uh, and essentially, this, this measures the progress of an oil as it's going rancid. And what it measures is the, the volatile byproducts that are given off. And this is largely formic acid. So we can use the biomarker formic acid to test if oils that we're taking are rancid or not. So now we've got two tests. We've got malondialdehyde for the rancidity of the person and formic acid to test the rancidity of an oil. So to test if an oil is rancid, you put formic acid on the test vial, formic acid on the patient. You check that they don't weaken to that in the clear. And then you put on the oil or food that you want to test. And if an indicator muscle weakens, then you know that that oil is rancid and you shouldn't take it. So to test if a person is going rancid, if they have high lipid peroxidation, you test with malondialdehyde. So you put the test vial malondialdehyde on the body and test an indicator muscle. If it weakens, you know that person has high malondialdehyde, so they've got high levels of lipid peroxidation, high levels of rancidity. So what you need to do, you need to cross-check against that weakness for a good oil, because good oils will replace bad oils in the body. So you can cross-check with the oils from um, our oils are in product kit two. We have rejigged our product kit recently. We've now got three product kits. And the first two are nutrients, and the third one is herbs and spices and speciality formulas. So we've rejigged them so that they're easier to use. So the oils are all together in product kit two, and there's probably about 18 or so to test. So you then find a good oil for your patient. And what you need to do if a person is going rancid, you need to give them some antioxidant uh, capability. So we test for, we've got a new product, Smart Vitamin E, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But you want to test for Smart Vitamin E against the malondialdehyde. 
and also smart vitamin C because vitamin C recycles vitamin E. And in our smart vitamin C product, we also have alpha lipoic acid, which recycles vitamin C. So we've got alpha lipoic acid recycling vitamin C and vitamin C recycling vitamin E. So that combination is a very good antioxidant formula. So here's a really good diagram, I think, to, to show how important it is to have uh, vitamin E, a lot of vitamin E activity in your cell membrane. As you can see, the, the free radicals coming in here, they're swooping in, and this half of the diagram has no vitamin E, and you can see what's happening to the fatty acids on the um, phospholipids here. So this is in the cell membrane, so this is damaging the cell membrane quite radically. And then this side of the diagram, you can see here there's vitamin E that's nestled quite nicely next to, the, next to the fatty acid tails there. And when you get an attack from a free radical, it comes in and the vitamin E traps the free radical. And you can see there there's no damage at all to the cell membrane. So we need lots of those in our cell membranes. And I often wonder where we get all our vitamin E from because we've got a lot of free, free radical activity going on in the body. Each time we have a metabolic process going on, each time the immune system generates a respiratory burst to uh, fight infection, you get free radical activity. Each time you detoxify anything, you get free radical activity. Um, in hypoxia, which a lot of people are, do show to be hypoxic, you get a lot of free radical generation. So it does seem to me we need a lot of vitamin E to fight that. So I looked at a website to try and get it from the diet. I thought, well, Perhaps we can increase our vitamin E rich foods. And I looked at a website which said these were the top, top 10 um, high vitamin E foods. So I thought I'd put together some kind of diet or menu really for the day to have a high um, vitamin E intake. So from there, we, we need 20, milligra 20 milligrams of vitamin E is the recommended daily allowance. So that's the bare minimum really. And from the foods, I picked out trout. I could have had trout for dinner, which was good. I could have had broccoli and spinach along with that, and sweet potato and butternut squash. So that was dinner. And for lunch, I could have had avocado, which was lovely. I love avocado. And olive oil was on the list, so I could have had olive oil with the avocado. Although olive oil was, uh, they gave you the amount of vitamin E per 100 grams. So per 100 grams, it was 14 milligrams. So I'm not going to get very much, really, in my avocado. I could have had some nuts as a snack. Almonds were good. And I could have had sunflower seeds on my porridge in the morning. But the problem is the sunflower seeds were quoted at 100 grams for 36 uh, milligrams of vitamin E. So I wouldn't get a lot, really, on my porridge. So adding all this up, I got 14 milligrams of vitamin E. And the recommended daily allowance was 20. So I'm going to stick to taking the smart vitamin E to, um, to keep my vitamin E levels up. So this is our smart vitamin E. Uh, it's a combination of three oils. Uh, as you probably know, we've been using organic wheat germ oil as a source of vitamin E. Uh, that's a very good source of vitamin E, high source of vitamin E. And it also has the whole vitamin E complex. It has uh, four tocotrienols in there and four tocopherols. So it's a really good source. Um, but we found we can enhance that by adding organic pistachio nut oil. This pistachio nut is a good source of vitamin E, and it's particularly a good source of the gamma tocopherols. Now, the gamma tocopherols are really important in the cell membrane, so this is going to work really well against the free radical attack. It also contains polyphenols, which um, give you a good antioxidant capability. So that's a good addition to our vitamin E, smart vitamin E. And the third oil is organic sesame seed oil. Now, this does have a relatively high content of vitamin E, about 9 or so percent. But the great thing about sesame seed oil, it has a compound in it called sesame. Now, sesame inhibits the breakdown of vitamin E. So this is going to lead to a higher level of vitamin E in the body. So if we just go forward to the slide about this. So that's the organic wheat germ I talked about with the tocopherols and tocotrienols. That's the pistachio oil with the high gamma tocopherol. And here's the sesame. Now, sesame inhibits a process called tocopherol alpha hydroxylation, which is the metabolism, the breakdown of vitamin E. 
So this will then cause a relative increase of vitamin E in the body. And in particular, the, the uh, types of vitamin E, the gamma tocopherol and gamma tocotrienols, that's going to be particularly good for the cell membranes. So with the, the high level of vitamin E in the wheat germ and the pistachio, and the sesame in the sesame seed to stop you breaking down vitamin E, this is a really high, um, high volume vitamin E product. And it fits in with our sort of SMART principle, which, as we've said before, is by using food substances as nutrients. You get the complete complex. You get all the enzymes, the different plant compounds in there, which all work together in a natural way with the body. So that's our vitamin E product. So as I was saying earlier, you need a good supply of high-quality oils to feed the brain. And we do a whole range of cold-pressed organic oils. These have not been chemically processed in any way. Uh, we do steep these in watercress, because watercress has um, an enzyme in it called phospholipase A. And this enzyme cleaves out the damaged area of the cell membrane. So then you would be cleaving out the damaged area, and then you would be filling that cell membrane with the good fatty acids in the oil. And it also contains selenium, and selenium happens to be a cofactor of this particular enzyme. And they're all in beautiful mirror glass, which protects them from going rancid. We do a range of constitutional oils for the red, blue, and green body type. Uh, they've got the specific oils that, e that each body type requires. So the red would be flax, hemp, pumpkin, and olive. And that's a good mix of omega-3, 6, and 9. And then the blue is flax, pumpkin, walnut, which is a higher percentage of omega-3. And the green is more um, predominantly omega-6, grapeseed, hazelnut, peanut, and sesame. And what also what we do with these oils, we make a face cream for each body type. So, for example, the red person, the oils that the red person needs on their skin is the flax, hemp, pumpkin, and olive. So we've put that all into a face cream. We've also added the components of collagen into that cream, so it's hyaluronic acid and the uh, nutrients that help to make collagen, so the, the B6 in the form of P5P, the two types of B12, adenosyl and methylcobalamin, and also folic acids. That's all in the cream together. These are the other oils we do. Um, I won't go through these. I'll just pick out, because we're talking about the omega-3 fatty acids. Flaxseed is a good source of omega-3. And walnut is also a good source of omega-3. So these are all in the, in the product kits. Uh, macadamia oil there, that's a source of palmitoleic acid, which is omega-7. And that's very good for dry skin. So for uh, dry skin or dry eyes or vaginal dryness, it's very good for. And we also have the high GLA content oils, so that's more of the omega-6 side. If you feel people aren't converting, then you can give them the GLA content oils. So that's the black currant seed, evening primrose, and borage. So the role of fats and oils in dementia. Well, the polyunsaturated fatty acids that are used in the brain are DHA and uh, AA. So that's doca, doxahexanoic acid and arachidonic acid. So you need to convert the plant oils that you take into these particular fatty acid derivatives. And DHA is primarily in the cerebral cortex, which is used for working memory and short-term memory. And arachidonic acid is primarily in the hippocampus, which is used for the consolidation of short-term to long-term memory and for spatial navigation. So here's a picture of the brain and the area at the front, the frontal cortex, that's the area where there's so much DHA. You can see what a large proportion of the brain it is, really. <coughs> So DHA is the most abundant omega-3 fatty acid in the brain. It constitutes 40% of the polyunsaturated fatty acids in the brain. And if you were able to weigh the, the, mem the membrane of the neuron, it would be 50% of the weight. So we make, this from, we make DHA from alpha-linolenic acid, so from the omega-3 that we take on board in the diet or as supplements. And we can also make it from, we get it from the diet, so from fish oil or from breast milk for babies. So it's the most unsaturated fat in the brain. Um, this is because of its structure. Its structure is 22 carbons and six double bonds. 
So it's a high amount of double bonds which make it so susceptible to going rancid. And the presence of DHA in the brain increases the fluidity of the cell membrane, so for the importance of all the substances going in and out of the cell. This is a simplistic diagram of how we make a DHA in the body. Uh, we st we've got, you've got the, the uh, essential fatty acid charts, but this is just taking a small proportion of that just to illustrate the point. So we start with alpha-linolenic acid, so the omega-3 there. And this is um, the naming convention for omega-3. We've got 18, which means 18 carbons, so the chain is 18 carbons long. It has three double bonds, and the first one starts um, after the third carbon, the third carbon from the methyl end. And that's converted into EPA, which has had the um, carbon chain extended to 20 carbons, and it has more double bonds, five double bonds. And then we go on to DPA, and the carbon chain is extended to 22, still five double bonds. Then when we get to DHA, we're at a length of 22 with six double bonds. So we've got six double bonds in DHA. This is a slightly more in detail look at the process. So we've got alpha-linolenic acid at the top there. And the processes that go on in fatty acid metabolism are desaturation and elongation. So this first enzyme here, delta-6 desaturase, is adding a double bond. Desaturation adds a double bond. So we've got 18 there, 18,3 being desaturated to 18,4. And this enzyme here uses the, uh, the coenzyme B6 and the cofactors magnesium and zinc. So then we go down from 18,4, we then have to elongate the fatty acid. So we use the elongase enzyme, which uh, uses B3. And then we get a uh, fatty acid of 20, so that's been elongated to 20. And then we have to desaturate again, so we're adding another double bond, so that makes it 25, and that's EPA. And we have to go on, really, with the same, the same process of elongating from 20 to 22. And then we elongate again to 24, and then we desaturate by adding an extra double bond, so we're now 6. Then we have to shorten it again to um, 22 for DHA. So we end up with 22,6 in DHA. And another very important enzyme in this fatty acid metabolism, from DPA to DHA, we use the enzyme delta-4 desaturase. Now that uses B6, magnesium, and biotin. But also delta-4 desaturase is very prevalent in pumpkin seeds. So that's a good thing to remember. DPA to DHA also needs delta-4 desaturase. So I thought it was quite interesting to show the different shapes of the fatty acids. I think the shape they have means they do a very different function in the body. So we've got, al Ooh. We've got alpha linolenic acid here with the three bonds here, giving that particular shape, which is converted via a couple of intermediates to EPA. So the shape has changed quite radically here. We've now got five double bonds here, which has changed the shape. And then DHA, EPA sorry, is converted to DHA, which now is quite a radically different shape from the omega-3 that you started with. So as I said, the enzymes in a fatty acid metabolism are um, desaturation process enzymes and also elongase enzymes, as we saw on the diagram. So we've learned that there can be a lot of genetic variability in enzymes, and if you had this, have this genetic variability in the enzymes which, produce, um, fat, which carry out fatty acid metabolism, then you're going to jeopardize your ability to uh, convert to DHA and AA. So people can have polymorphisms in their genes, or they can have acquired a defect in the genes from toxicity, from toxic metals, chemicals, or radiation. And if this is the case, we have to look for what we can do for those people. So we look for what coenzymes they need and what cofactors they may need to upregulate that pathway. So to test for defects in producing DHA, we can start by using the, the test vial for alpha linolenic acid, ALA. All these uh, fatty acid test vials are in the master nutrition box. So you put ALA on the body 
And if that weakens, you know that that person isn't effectively converting their ALA to the other fatty acid derivatives. Now, this may not show, really, until the person has taken um, an omega-3 supplement. I had a patient come to me, and on the first visit, he strengthened to ALA, so I gave him flaxseed oil. Then on the subsequent visit, he weakened to it, so clearly he wasn't converting the ALA, the flaxseed that he'd been taking. So what you do then, you, you put ALA on the body and you negate the weakness with coenzymes or cofactors. So in this case, you would try P5P as the coenzyme um, or the cofactors uh, zinc or magnesium. So you'd go through all the zincs and magnesiums in the project kits. And my particular client strengthened to uh, a zinc. So that then helped him to break down alpha linolenic acid. So DHA, we can also get that from uh, fish sources. So uh, in the diet. So the, the main source of DHA are tuna, mackerel, swordfish, salmon, anchovies. Now actually I've been increasing my input of anchovies since I learned this, um, but the thing is I don't really like pizza and that's the only place people tend to get anchovies. So what I've been doing, I've been getting anchovies and mashing them up a little bit and putting them into <coughs> casseroles or into stir fries because they give a really good flavour and you're increasing, really, your intake of DHA. So salmon has uh, between 500 and 1,500 uh, milligrams per 100 gram. So I thought that's quite a wide variation, really. But I suppose it depends on the quality of the salmon. Now, mostly in the supermarkets, you get farmed salmon these days. But if we're going to buy salmon, we tend to buy Alaskan sockeye salmon, which is a much better quality and hopefully has more DHA in it. So the recommended daily intake for DHA plus, D plus EPA is 600 uh, milligrams. So you need to be eating quite a lot of fish each day, really, to get that, to get that amount. Now, there is some marine um, alg algae-based products which contain DHA as well. So th there's been a lot of research done on, the, on DHA and dementia. And a low level of DHA has been associated with cognitive decline, and you're more likely to develop dementia or other cognitive problems if you ha have low DHA. And a study in Canada uh, showed that Alzheimer's patients had lower levels of DHA than other elderly patients. So DHA also accumulates in phosphatidylserine, and phosphatidylserine controls apoptosis so low levels of DHA will give you low phosphatidylserine, and that will lead to an increase in neural cell death. So that's going to uh, compound the problem even more. And this happens particularly in the hippocampus, which is the area that's most affected uh, with Alzheimer's. So the research that's been done on DHA and Alzheimer's shows that sufferers of Alzheimer's have much lower levels in their hippocampus, in the neur neurons of their hippocampus, um, and as I said, that's the area severely affected in Alzheimer's. And DHA supplementation has been shown to improve, help to improve memory in Alzheimer's and age-related memory problems. There have been some studies in mice and primates that um, showed that when you deplete uh, their diet of DHA, give them a very low DHA diet, this causes them learning and memory problems. But by refeeding DHA, by putting DHA back in their diet, this reverses these problems. So this would lead us to think that increasing your DHA will help you to develop your learning and your memory. So some studies were done in Chicago and Rotterdam, and they found a 60% reduction in, um, in the risk of Alzheimer's if you take omega-3 oils. Yes, yes, it's lo it lowers your risk of developing Alzheimer's. And they also found that um, by taking plant-derived omega-3, this was associated with a reduction in the risk of Alzheimer's in subjects with the APOE4 gene expression. Because it has been noticed that people with Alzheimer's tend to have APOE4, so it is a bit of an indicator that if you have APOE4, you may go on to get Alzheimer's. Not necessarily, but you, you may do. There seems to be a correlation there. So what does REDS have to do? We have to control the, the APOE4. And the way to do that is to get the test file, APOE4, which is in our new pain and diagnostic test kit. 
and put that on the body, and then f and you get a weakness then, and then you need to find what negates it. So in my case, it was pyridoxine. So I'm going to carry on taking my B6 uh, to help with the APOE4 gene expression that red people have. So the conversion of fatty acids to DHA, well, all the literature seems to say that this conversion is really very um, inefficient in humans. We saw from the diagram how long-winded the procedure was. You had to elongate, desaturate, transport here, there, and everywhere, and then shorten to get to DHA. And I looked up some of the figures of the conversion, and in a healthy young man, from all his dietary omega-3 that he, he took on board, he only produced about 8% EPA and then about 4% DHA. In women, it's slightly higher. We have a better conversion rate. So women get about, if they're healthy, get about 21% EPA and then it's about 9% uh, DHA. So really, it's not very high. Is it 4% and 9%? It's not, not really very high at all. It's estimated that to get 200 milligrams per day of DHA, which is quite on the lower end of what you need, you would need up to 40 grams of flaxseed oil. That's probably about seven teaspoons of flaxseed oil. So <laughs> if anyone can take that, then hats off to them, really. So we did our own clinical research into DHA and how, how to encourage people to make their own DHA. We looked at the marine algae products, but they were very expensive. And it really doesn't fit in with our functional biochemistry principles. We want to give people the substances that they can make um, what they need in the body. So deficiency in DHA was often caused by conversion problems. Now the way we tested this was we tested using the fatty acid test files. So from, from a position of weakness, we tested people to ALA, and if they were taking enough omega-3 oils, then they wouldn't, that wouldn't be a problem for them. And then we went on to see if they strengthened to EPA. And then went, this is what happens generally in most cases. And then went on to see if they strengthened to um, DPA. And then DHA was the next in the chain. And the majority of people strengthened to DHA. So indicating that people are, are low in DHA. And then conversely, if you work from strength, you put DPA on the body and you get a weakness, which shows that they're not converting their DPA. So when we were doing this testing, the, there was a combination of two oils which consistently strengthened people who had low DHA. So from this, we concluded that these two oils were allowing the patient to make their own DHA. So this is our, our new product. We've combined these oils into a new product which encourages people to make their own DHA. And what we've called it is smart thinking oil. And this is a combination of pumpkin seed oil, which is a wonderful oil we all know, but also, quite surprisingly, rapeseed oil. And we have a bit of vitamin E in there as well to protect it. Now, the rapeseed oil that's had a bit of a bad press over the, over the past few years, um, it's been noted as having high levels of erucic acid and high levels of glucosinolates, neither of which are very good for the body. But that was in wild rapeseed, and now they use a different strain, and this is called a very low erucic acid oil, and it's, uh, <coughs> the percentage is less than 1%, so it's very negligible. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's obviously imperative to get a really good source of rapeseed oil, and the source that we have is unrefined, organic, cold-pressed, and GM-free. Now, rapeseed oil has a relatively high amount of omega-3 in it. The, uh, the oil that we use, the ratio is 3 to 1. So you've got 3 omega-6 to 1 omega-3. <coughs> and there has been some research done into the connection between rapeseed oil and the production of DHA in the body. Lloyd Horrocks from um, Ohio State University did a study where he, he took three groups of people. The first group, he put them on olive oil, the second group on sunflower oil, and the third group on rapeseed oil. And after taking these oils for a while, he then measured the DHA levels, and the DHA levels were highest in the rapeseed oil group. So what he concluded was that the um, linolen linolenic acid, so the omega-3, must have been channeled into making DHA, 
perhaps by inhibition of the delta-6 desaturase, decreasing the conversion of LA, omega-6, to ARA, to arachidonic acid. So what's happening really, something in the oil is pushing the enzymes to convert omega-3 to DHA and inhibiting the conversion from LA to arachidonic acid. This will give you more, more DHA. So what we concluded from this as well, our combination of pumpkin and rapeseed, there's factors in the pumpkin seed oil that are doing the same thing. They're inhibiting the omega-6 conversion to arachidonic acid, and they're stimulating the conversion of the uh, omega-3 from the rapeseed into DHA. So in the smart thinking oil, the rapeseed oil is a rich source of omega-3, which is the substrate of DHA. And then the pumpkin seed gives you the enzymatic activity needed to encourage the conversion of DPA to DHA as well. Remember in the chart that we looked at, the uh, other enzyme used in the conversion of DPA to DHA was delta-4 desaturase. So pumpkin seed is obviously a high source of delta-4 desaturase. So the oil is, is giving you that enzyme which enables you to convert DPA to DHA. This is also, this reflects our SMART principle of using foods in a natural synergistic way with the body. So here we go, here's the label of the SMART thinking oil. This is the, the product here. A nice mirror on bottle with the SMART thinking oil, so a combination of pumpkin and rapeseed oil. So this is really summarizing the benefits of DHA. So it's, it promotes uh, nervous system development and it optimizes memory. And it has been shown in research to help prevent age-related memory decline. So the other fat that's used by the brain is arachidonic acid. So the, the health of the brain depends on having the right amount of arachidonic acid. So this is an omega-6 derivative, whereas DHA was an omega-3 derivative, arachidonic acid is an omega-6 derivative, so it comes from linoleic acid. And this maintains the hippocampal cell, hippocampus cell membrane, and it protects the brain from going rancid from oxidative stress. Now we can get this from the diet, and the source of um, arachidonic acid is meat, eggs, and dairy. <coughs> So arachidonic acid is really important because it activates something called syntaxin 3, which is a protein involved in the growth and repair of neurons. And as we know in the brain, there's, it's in a constant state of flux. There's always new nerve connections being made. There's always new cell membranes to replace and to add. So growth and repair is really important. And if this arachidonic acid uh, metabolism is disrupted in any way, it can contribute to dementia and Alzheimer's. So foods high in arachidonic acid, they're red meat, they're beef, lamb, veal, venison, um, organ meats. Um, and as Chris was saying, probably there's not that many people that uh, include organ meats in their diet these days. But Chris assures me that he can do a beautiful um, organic liver on the barbecue, so I'm looking forward to that in the summer. Poultry is a good source of arachidonic acid, pork, the loin in particular. And peanut oil is very high in arachidonic acid, um, so it's a good thing for the brain to take peanut oil. And sesame and olive and avocado contain it as well. And egg yolks are a rich source. So here's a sort of simplistic diagram of how to make um, arachidonic acid in the body. So we start with linoleic acid, which is 18 carbons and two double bonds. That's converted to GLA, so that's adding a double bond there which is then converted to DGLA, which is lengthened to 20, and then arachidonic acid has, has four double bonds, so it's a length of 20 with four double bonds. So if people have defects in the synthesis of arachidonic acid, uh, you can test that. The main blockage tends to be between um, the first step, LA and GLA, which is the same enzyme, the delta-6 desaturase enzyme. So look at P5P, zinc, and magnesium there. And also, both sides of the essential fatty acid synthesis, the omega-3 and the omega-6, are codependent. So if there's problems in one side, it can reflect on the other. 
And you'll see that when you look at the chart, it will often say um, too much of a certain fatty acid will inhibit different pathways. And also on the chart, you'll see dietary factors causing problems. They're the same culprits, really, the trans fats, saturated fats, glucose and alcohol. And we do need to keep a good hormonal balance to keep our essential fatty acid production in, in a good condition. So we need to balance out the adrenaline, thyroxine, and glucocorticoids in particular. So you see all that on the chart. But also, arachidonic acid can also be a bad guy. Um, you don't want to meet him in a dark alley, would you? So you need enough arachidonic acid, but not too much. Because arachidonic acid is an inflammatory substance. So if you look on the chart, um, you probably can't see this one, but you've, got, you've all got a chart to look at. If you see in the middle there, arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is converted to the um, pro-inflammatory leukotrions and the PGE2 series, the thromboxins. So if you have too much, you're going to have high levels of pro-inflammatory uh, chemicals in the body. So to inhibit these, you need to look at the, the chart and uh, vitamin E, consider vitamin E, vitamin C, zinc and selenium. But what you need to do, you do need to produce enough of these substances, but not too much. And particularly with the thromboxins, you need to then carry on and convert thromboxins into prostacyclines. Now, prostacyclines are good for preventing platelet aggregation and for helping with vasodilation. So they're great for the cardiovascular system. So you want to make sure that you're converting your thromboxins onto prostacyclines. And this is stimulated by magnesium. But also, you see on the, your charts, it's stimulated by the dietary factors of ginger, onion, and garlic. And we do a fantastic product called GOG, which is ginger, onion, and garlic. And these are the organic powders of those ingredients. And it comes in a mirror pot. And it's fantastic to keep by your cooker. I use it a lot, really. You just use, teaspoon it into your cooking. You can use it in marinades, in casseroles, um, stir fries, in your spaghetti bolognese. So it's a great product because it's so quick and easy. And who's got time to sort of peel and grate the ginger and chop the garlic and things and the onion? And also, if you can find um, organic sources of those in the first place, which isn't always easy. So that's a great product to use. So that's arachidonic acid. You need to keep the, um, the amount balanced. So this is what I've said, really. Um, key inflammatory process, so you need to keep the balance of hormones um, under control. Because a continual low level of chronic inflammation destroys organs and it also destroys the brain. So that's what we've said really about what nutrients to look for, to take um, ginger, onion and garlic in the diet, to reduce the intake of bad omega-6 fats, the trans and hydrogenated fats, and also to keep your insulin levels uh, stable throughout the day. So fats are the prevention of memory loss and dementia. So this is just summarizing, really. Um, maintain a good supply of high-quality oils. Uh, they have to be cold-pressed. These are the cold-pressed parent essential oils, so the omega-3 and omega-6. Organic, really, is paramount because toxins themselves are a cause of neurological decline, so you don't want to be taking on board an oil thinking you're doing your brain some good, and really you're filling it up with toxins. I do, I do have a confession to make at this stage about the organic um, aspect, um, because a, f a few weeks ago I wasn't really feeling too good. I walked down to my local town, I had a pain in my right foot, my left knee hurt, I had a headache and felt dizzy. So I came back to Chris and said, would you just manipulate my foot? I'm sure there's a problem there. If you can just manipulate for me, it'll be fine. So he grabbed hold of my foot and said, oh, no, no, this isn't mechanical, this is biochemical. So we had to go through the process of finding what it was, and we used the eye positions that Chris has taught us. And I, uh, my eye position that showed positive was the um, intolerance one. And this, we tested, was something that I was eating. I thought, well, surely not eating in my house. It must be something I've had when I've been out, because I pride myself on having healthy food. But we tested, and it was something that I was eating in my home. So we went through all the ingredients, all the things I've been eating, and it suddenly came to me in, in a flash, oh my goodness, it's the olive oil. Because I'd rushed out after the holiday, had nothing in the house, and did all the shopping in the local supermarket. They had no organic oil, so I bought the most expensive one, thinking this would be fine. And I'd been using it for about two weeks, and it caused me all those problems. So it was a good lesson to me, really. So I just pass that on to you. 
Uh, so to help our memory and prevent dementia, we need to guard against the rancidity, the rancid fats, because that's a big issue for the brain because of the unsaturated fat content. And we need to check levels of... Um, so you can take your smart vitamin E to stop the rancidity. Check that you've got enough DHA, and if not, you can think about the smart thinking oil combination and regulate the ar arachidonic acid. So that's fats and memory. <laughs>